So Steve, during the pandemic, uh, other than like the many weird hobbies that I've developed, what's something that everybody did during the pandemic, just really kind of copying us? Well, uh, other than binge watching, say, uh, Tiger King, um, I think everybody uh, listened to podcasts and probably everybody listened to the Great Trials podcast. That's but, right. Uh, but podcasting, I think, was uh, was the answer you were going for there. Exactly. Podcasting and specifically being curious maybe about starting your own podcast. And if you're interested, this podcast is sponsored by Podbean. Podbean is the easiest way to create your own podcast. We here at The Great Trials Podcast use Podbean to host our podcast. You can download the free Podbean podcast app to start, record, and publish your very own podcast in minutes. Podbean provides everything you need to run your podcast, and you can record and publish the episodes directly from the app on your phone. Download the free Podbean app today. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N. Check it out. Welcome to the Great Trials Podcast, where you get a behind-the-scenes look at America's greatest trials with the trial lawyers who tried them. This is what we are supposed to do as lawyers. I always tell my students at SMU, remember this is a helping profession. And if your why is just to make as much money as you possibly can, then you'll never be able to sustain the long hours and the hard work and the stress that it takes to endure in this business. So I always challenge my law students to find their why. Please rise. Court is now in session. Welcome to the Great Trials podcast. Uh, this is Steve Lowry along with Yvonne Godfrey. Yvonne, uh, this is the first show of the new year. How are you? Uh, how are you doing in the new year? I'm good. Well, not yeah, quite guess, the new year yet. I mean, we're, we're, I'm lying a little bit. I mean, it, it, it's <laughs> oh, going to it's going to. It's going to play in the new year. So we're oh, going to play, uh, that was us doing like movie magic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in the 2020 mind frame yet. So. Right. Yeah, me either. I know there's too much to do before the end of the year, which is uh, one day away. Yeah. Um, I did want to I did want to make some announcements for our listeners. And first of all, since, you know, this is the um, we have just finished our first year of the podcast and uh, we've done much better than I thought we were going to do. And so I was just going to thank our listeners. And uh, I, I just looked, we're up almost to 33,000 downloads of the podcast. So uh, that's, you know, in my mind, really good yeah. uh, from all over the world, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we have a couple from, uh, you know, China, Pakistan, Canada, we have them from all over the place. So, uh, so I'm really excited. And, and, um, and I, uh, you know, just wanted to thank our listeners. Hope they'll stick with us in the new year. And uh, and as always, we uh, we want them to uh, rate and review us if they uh, would be so kind. Yeah, cool, exciting. Yeah. So um, so to start the new year, uh, we decided we were going to do something special and and um, do a little bit different podcast. And we're this is actually the uh, part one of a two part podcast, and this involves the case of Dr. Christopher Dunch, uh, which was a uh, he was a neurosurgeon in Dallas, Texas, and um, it, he was the subject of the podcast uh, Doctor Death um, that was on Wondery and was wildly popular, but. Um, and so we have two great guests, uh, one this week and one next week. Uh, this week we have Kay Van Way, who is a uh, uh, partner in the law firm of uh, Van Way, Presby and Williams uh, down in Dallas, Texas. And she handles primarily medical malpractice plaintiff's cases. And, uh, and she will, she's our guest today. And, uh, and then next week we will have uh, Michelle Shugart, who is the, um, from the Dallas County um, District Attorney's Office, and she actually prosecuted the criminal part of this case, and we're going to get into why this case um, uh, got to the point of, uh, of a criminal case. Kay, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, we are uh, very excited to have you on the podcast, and um, this uh, story, and, and we'll get into it in detail, this story is just such a, a, a crazy story, um, you know, for especially for lawyers who do medical malpractice. Um, you know, to see uh, uh, just the level of um, 
uh, of, I mean, I, I guess you could call it incompetence, but it almost, you know, in fact, the, the jury found it went past incompetence that, you know, he was so dangerous that he knew he was going to be injuring people. Uh, but this, this story um, is one you just, uh, you don't hear of much. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, <laughs> that's ex that's exactly right. And we should mention, Steve, that that you and I both listen to this podcast, the the Doctor Death podcast. I think just because we just like podcasts, but right, in right. listening to that podcast, um, which is which is really well done, as a as a lawyer, um, or and with some background in medical malpractice, it's really shocking. I mean, this is kind of like the the such a nightmare scenario in terms of what patients knew or more or more accurately did not know or weren't able to find out and and the work that that Kay did in in these cases is pretty amazing so I'm just I'm really excited that we at, at the time we listened and talked about this podcast we had no idea we'd get the opportunity to talk to the lawyers involved so yeah no really I, I listened to the podcast just because it, it was a great podcast and then uh you know as I was listening to it and, and um you know I was like man it'd be really cool to be able to to talk to the uh to the lawyers who are actually involved in this case, and I, and I will say, and we're and we're going to get into this some with uh, with Kay, but you know, to, to get on our, our soapbox a little bit here, um, you know, if if I could encourage everybody to listen to just one episode of the Doctor Death podcast, it would be episode number six, where they talk about how something like this can happen, and it and a big part of it really goes to the level of tort reform. Uh, that has occurred in Texas uh, that makes it so uh, it is very difficult to take medical medical malpractice cases, even when there are really egregious circumstances. Uh, and, um, and then the fact that the medical system itself wasn't really willing or, or able to police itself to uh, remove a doctor like Dr. Dunch before he uh, injured so many people. Uh, but we'll talk about that some more, but, uh, but I, uh, uh, really feel strongly about that this is just an example of of why um, you have to be really careful about these reforms that on paper sound good but in reality uh, can cause uh, lots of problems but uh, but Kay you know so we can get into the case let me first uh, tell everybody a little bit about you I've already told them that you're a partner at Van Way Presby and Williams in uh, Dallas Texas and you can look up Kay at vwpwlaw.com um, uh, I don't, you know, V is in Victor or Van Way. So VWPWlaw.com. And you can look up K Van Way. Uh, K has been, uh, a, uh, been practicing medical malpractice law, uh, since 1983. Uh, she is a board certified personal injury trial lawyer with a specialty, specialty in catastrophic, uh, and fatal, uh, injury cases. Um, she is a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we won't talk about the, the game uh, this weekend against LSU. Um, but, and she also is a graduate, got her law degree at Oklahoma City University School of Law. And she has been named a Texas super lawyer from 2003 through the present. Uh, she has been named as D Magazine, that's a, a magazine in, in Dallas, as the best lawyer, it was one of the best lawyers in Dallas in 2016 and 2018. She's been named uh, by the Dallas Bar Association as a trial legend uh, in 2017. She was named in the best lawyers in America for medical malpractice for 2020. And she is an AV rated uh, Martindale, uh, AV rated by Martindale Hubble and just a fantastic lawyer. And also I should mention, she is an adjunct professor at SMU School of Law. So Kay, we're very excited to have you on the, uh, on the show. Well, thank you. And I think all of those accolades just mean that you've lived long enough and practiced law long <laughs> enough to, uh, collect a few awards along the way and not shoot yourself in the foot or blow yourself <laughs> up in the process. So yeah, that's the hope. That's the hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whole idea, right? <laughs> yeah. it, sometimes it feels like it gets harder and harder every year. Um, but, uh, but let's, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background of, of this case, Kay, but uh, there, there's so much information here uh, that where you feel like you need to fill in, uh, uh, fill in, but um, um you know, and I, and I really want to find out how you got involved, how you kind of, you know, figured out what was going on. And I know it took a number of people uh, involved, but let's just start with, uh, so Dr. Christopher Dunch uh, was a neurosurgeon in Dallas. 
uh, practicing mainly from 2010 to 2012. And on paper, uh, he really looked like what I would call a rock star. Uh, he came from the University of Tennessee. He had a uh, medical degree and had, had done a residency in neurosurgery. He also had a PhD. Uh, he got a fellowship in, um, in, in the spine and um, just came as somebody who, on, like I said, on paper, um, looked uh, really, really promising as a neurosurgeon. And he gets a job at uh, the first hospital, I think it's called uh, Baylor Plano. And I should also mention, uh, Kay, that the, the case that you sent us, and I, and I know you ended up representing uh, about a dozen uh, people that were injured by Dr. Dunch, but the case that you sent us uh, was the case of Mary Eford versus Baylor Healthcare System or Baylor Regional Medical Center at Plano. I think it's called Baylor Plano uh, down there. And, um, and it essentially, um, is what I would call a sort of a negligent cr credentialing case uh, and, and a negligent failure or a, neg or a fraud case almost where they didn't report the things that they knew about Dr. Dunch. But so as Dr. Dunch goes along, um, there start to be, for, first of all, starting in residency, there was a report um, that he was using cocaine while performing surgery. Uh, he was then called down uh, to give a drug test. He made an excuse that he had to go to the ICU before he could do his drug test and then apparently uh, just disappeared for three days um, and never got that drug test. Um, he was sent to a, a, a rehab program but ends up finishing his, uh, his residency and he gets a job at Baylor Plano. And uh, all I can say is, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut through a lot of this, but he from what I heard, he operated on a total of 38 patients. And out of those 38 patients, 33 were injured, 20 of which were seriously injured, and two of which died. Um, and it, when they, when how this case unfolded, or how the, the um, uh, information about this doctor unfolded was that, you know, first of all, there was all kinds of reports of him acting erratically, acting like he was on uh, abusing various substances. I think there were reports of cocaine, of drinking vodka in the morning, of Oxycontin, of um, uh, Xanax, uh, and Lortab, and some, and some other drugs. And, um, and when he was doing these surgeries, um, basically the staff in the OR and the doctors who he was uh, performing these, these surgeries with were um, just talking about what just seemed to be a startling lack of skill in performing surgeries. And uh, as we'll talk about, some of the doctors who actually had to go in and repair some of his work um, uh, just said it, they couldn't tell if he was intentionally trying to injure these patients or just had no idea what he was doing. And one doctor, uh, even uh, I think it was Dr. Robert Henderson, you know, he, he wasn't even sure that Dr. Dunch was a real doctor and even followed up with the University of Tennessee to make sure he was the correct guy, but, but basically he performs a number of surgeries where there are just severe injuries, including the fact that he made his best friend a quadriplegic, uh, and including the fact that he, that two people died, uh, from his surgeries. Um, and then the, the case of Mary Eford, which was one of the ones, um, where he, he, um, he actually severed her, her nerve root, uh, was putting pedicle screws into muscle, not into bone. Um, and that, and essentially, uh, he, he goes on being passed from hospital to hospital. Uh, nobody's really doing anything about it. Uh, the uh, medical board wasn't taking much action or not action quickly enough. Um, the hospitals weren't reporting him to the, uh, national practitioner data bank, which we'll talk about some more. Um, and so he was allowed to keep operating on people and, and he kept injuring and hurting people until the point where the Dallas County uh, District Attorney's Office got involved and uh, prosecuted him for uh, essentially aggravated assault. And, uh, and we'll be talking, like I said, to the, the, the Assistant District Attorney, Michelle Shugart, next week um, about uh, what she did in order to get a criminal conviction against a doctor for what he did in the operating room. Um, so, okay, I know I sort of went over a, a, a lot of information there and, and 
quickly went through what happened with Dr. Dunch. And, and as I said, if anybody wants to really listen to this or, or find out in depth what happened with Dr. Dunch, uh, the Dr. Death Pat podcast uh, is, is excellent and really goes through uh, the whole thing. But, but Case, t- talk a little bit about how you came to be involved in this case and how you started hearing about what was happening with Dr. Dunch. Well, I first became involved through the Mary Eford case and um, became uh, acquainted with her when she was in rehab um, after she had had the corrective surgery performed on her uh, by Dr. Henderson. And I went to see her and her daughter who was there with her in rehab. And, you know, as a lawyer who's practiced in the personal injury field for 30 some odd years or whatever, you know, we've all been in those situations with clients who are just in excruciating pain. But this uh, scene plays out in my mind over and over again, just how much pain this poor woman was in. Um, Probably the next thing I did after she hired me was to go talk to Dr. Robert Henderson. And I had never heard in all of my years of practicing law, I had never heard a subsequent treater talk to me the way Dr. Henderson spoke with me about Mary Eford. And he was just struggling to try to explain to me how these injuries could have occurred to her uh, because they were so bizarre. And he was describing it to me in a way such as this denotes a basic ignorance of anatomy 101. I mean, an inability to to differentiate between spinal structures, muscles, and nerves and, and so on and so forth. So that's how I first became involved. This episode of the Great Trials Podcast is brought to you by Legal Technology Services or LTS. Yvonne, have you ever been in the courtroom and right when you're about to make the big point to the judge or to the jury, play a video, bring up a document and your technology has frozen or not worked? No joke, Steve, that has never happened to me because I use LTS. Yes, and LTS, Legal Technology Services, are experts at legal courtroom technology, whether you're talking about demonstrative exhibits, playing videos, doing day in the life videos, or doing settlement videos, or just presenting your evidence to the jury. These are the experts. They can also help you out as far as scheduling depositions nationwide. They can take care of it, arrange for the court reporter, the videographer, arrange the location. They get what a trial involves, they get what a deposition involves, and you can use them to make your life a lot easier. They have also been voted four times as either the best of trial services or best hot seat technician by the Daily Report. So you should definitely call them up. And when you do, mention the Great Trials podcast. And that's Legal Technology Services. You can talk to Bob, Melanie, or anyone else on their team. They are fantastic people and fantastic at their jobs. Legal Technology Services at LTSAtlanta.com. That's LTSAtlanta.com. And, and you know, one thing that really struck me in this case that, um, you know, uh, you, you don't really, in, in medical malpractice cases, or it's not often that you hear other doctors coming forward to talk about, um, you know, what, what a doctor's been doing in the operating room or to uh, find out about, um, you know, what some of the staff is saying in the OR. Uh, and, um, and then even to hear about that, it, this is, that Mary Eford wasn't the only one that this happened to. It was happening to a number of other people. I, I guess what I'm wondering is how, how did that information start to come out where, where you realized that this wasn't just a case about one person, but was about multiple people? Well, as I'm sure is the case in other states, we have, uh, for example, the Dallas Trial Lawyers Association has a listserv. And I had heard that he had been at a hospital prior to the hospital where he operated on Mary Eford and that there had been some bad outcomes there. So I went on the Dallas trial lawyers listserv and said, Hey, I have a brand new case involving this doctor by the name of Christopher Dunch. Um, Does anybody else have 
cases or information to share or whatever. And so a lawyer by the name of Rob Crane called me almost instantly. And Rob Crane is one of those lawyers that what I call a lawyer's lawyer, just top notch, just top of the heap, excellent ethics, smart, great trial lawyer. And he says, well, sit down and get a pad out. And which I did, which I probably have laying around here somewhere today, <laughs> literally on the yellow pad, you know, he starts telling me everything that happened up until the Mary Eford case. And he was just shocked and outraged <clears throat> because he thought that the story, the part of the story that he knew because of his involvement with the two victims at Baylor, he thought that was the end of the road. So when he learned, you know, I learned from him everything that had happened beforehand. And then he learned from me, um, you know, about the ongoing story. And of course, then at the end of that conversation, he and I thought, well, at least we know the damage is contained now. This is the end of the road, right? Yeah. So as it turns <laughs> out, it was really only the beginning. It. Ugh. It's just, it's just really shocking. I just, I can't get over how long this continued, how many people were hurt. And I mean, thank goodness that you all were, were able to sort of communicate with each other um, because I guess that's what, that's what struck me the most about listening to the podcast initially and learning about the case afterwards is I think um, just as a general, just as a, person in the world, you think that there's certain things that just won't happen, that there, there will be safeguards or that there's this information that will be available to pu the public and that something like this can never happen. And it's just, I get chills every time I hear about it because it's just, it's one of those things you think can never happen. <laughs> well, it, you know, it can happen. It did happen. Um, I always tell people, this is not the first cocaine addicted spine surgeon case I've ever had. And, you know, a decade or so prior to Dr. Dunch, I had a case involving a cocaine addicted spine surgeon. And in his case, he didn't move from hospital to hospital, but <clears throat> the hospital kept him on despite knowing that he had a drug addiction problem and that he was leaving a trail of bodies behind him. But what stood between in that case, what stood between the hospital being able to stay in business or not was this spine surgeon because he was doing these complex 360 degree mm -hmm. spine surgeries that took 12 or 13 hours and billing, you know, six figures for each one. And they were drug testing him, but he was, we found out later that he was uh, putting a vial of somebody else's urine on a necklace around his neck so that it would be wow. close to his body. And so they were unsupervised urinalysis. So um, they finally stepped up the vigilance a little bit and said, well, you know what? Um, you're passing all these drug tests, but something is not adding up here, doctor. We'd like for you to submit to a hair sample. And he says, no problem. I'll, I'll be here first thing in the morning for that hair sample test. And he shows up at the hospital with not a single hair on his oh body. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Not to be graphic, but no, not a single hair on his body anywhere. And uh, <laughs> the the stubble, you know, like shaving bleached blonde. And um, <laughs> they thought that was unusual, but yeah. <laughs> the evidence directly. So, you know, let's just let the guy keep operating. Um, and oh. then, of course, you know, trial lawyers being the twisted people that we are, there were I think I represented nine or 10 of those victims and there were other really good lawyers in Dallas who had some of the cases and somebody, one of these trial lawyers said to me one day, do you know how to keep Dr. So-and-so out of the operating room? I was like, no, tell me how. And he said, just put a white line in front of the door. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I, the point being in, you know, speaking of getting on a soapbox, don't get me wound up, but you know, <laughs> Dr. Dunch, what happened with the Dr. Dunch case, this was not the first time mm. a doctor developed a drug problem and hurt people and was passed from institution to institution. 
Um, and it will not be the last. I, I hate to be Debbie Downer that way, but I guarantee this will not be the last because all of the circumstances that allowed this to happen existed long before Dr. Dunch and they still exist. Mm. And <clears throat> it's multifactorial. And, you know, if you, if you're interested, I'd love to kind of go through what some of those factors are, but yeah. it's, it's shocking to me, even as somebody that's old and has practiced law a long time, it's shocking to me that the system is so rigged to protect doctors and to protect hospitals and to keep secrets from patients. And, you know, as I've become older, um, all kidding aside, I'm not really all that old. <laughs> As I become older, you know, I think, wow, I'm going to become more of a consumer of health care as I begin to age. And it pisses me off as a patient. Yeah. I forget being a lawyer, but I'm a patient. Everybody that I love and care about is a patient. And um, you really just have no way of knowing um, vital information that you ought to be able to know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can you talk about some of those factors? Because I think, even as a lawyer, I just didn't, I didn't really understand how, how this could happen. Well, and, and Kay, before you go through the factors, lay out a little bit about what Baylor Plano knew. I mean, there, there had been multiple surgeries at this place. One person who became a quadriplegic from fairly a routine surgery, and there had been allegations of him, of the doctor using cocaine the night before, and then a woman dies, and then they... Uh, you know, he leaves, but they let him resign. They, they basically give him a letter of recommendation saying there's no, no outstanding investigations. They don't report him to the medical board. They don't report him to the national practitioner database. And they basically just pass him on. I mean, what I, what I saw what Baylor Plano did in, in my mind is, is just as criminal as what Dr. Dunch did. But, um, but, but I just want you to lay out a little bit about what uh, Baylor Plano did and then talk, then let's get you up on your soapbox. And I, I, I definitely want to talk okay. about these issues. Right. Cause once you get me up on it, you might not get me off. Of <laughs> right. So right. Exactly. Save that till the end. We're all there. <laughs> well, <clears throat> for the non med mal lawyers out there, these are not typical cases where you have subpoena power and you send out your interrogatories and your requests for production and you start deposing witnesses to find out what happened and who knew what and when did they know it and what did they do about it? Because um, hospitals enjoy strict and powerful immunities. They are allowed to conduct all of their peer review activities in complete secrecy, all of their credentialing activities as well as their quality assurance. Um, so in other words, quality assurance, um, you know, well, starting at the beginning with credentialing, what they knew about Dr. Dunch when they decided to hire him, that's a credentialing decision, privileged. We're not able to find that out. What they knew about him as he practiced there in terms of their quality assurance, meaning were they tracking his outcomes? Were they tracking uh, return to the OR within a certain period of time? Were they tracking his blood loss rates, his infection rates to see how did he compare to other surgeons? Well, we wouldn't be able to find that out. Um, would we be able to find out, did they drug test him after um, one or more serious, serious outcomes? We wouldn't be able to find that out, much less what the result of the drug tests were. Would we be able to find out, did they have one of his peers, another neurosurgeon, review the results of these surgeries and determine whether there was error? We wouldn't know. So um, what exactly Baylor knew and when they knew it will always only be known to Baylor. What we do know is basically what came out in the criminal trial and what we were able to find out through um, kind of what I would call happenstance uh, sources, such as somehow the letter of recommendation that they gave Dr. Dunch getting released to the media. 
but in general terms, <coughs> excuse me, I'm battling this uh, seasonal cold. <laughs> yeah. In, in general terms, what we do know is that I believe if Baylor were here, Baylor would tell you that Dunch was foisted on them by the University of Tennessee because what they saw was a guy that looked like a rock star on paper and they had no knowledge of what happened with him in his residency. Um, what we do know is that he conducted very few surgeries there at Baylor and had two, what you would really call, what I would call never event outcomes. Um, a death after a routine back surgery is, it's not officially a never event, but let's just call it, it is a never, never event. Um, his roommate waking up a quad and all of that stuff. But we don't know what the result of Baylor's peer review was. We don't know exactly whether he passed drug tests or didn't. But what we know is that Baylor somehow negotiated a resignation. So rather than disciplining him and reporting him to the National Practitioner Data Bank so that downstream hospitals would know, they gave him a letter of recommendation and allowed him to resign. Uh, and presumably this was negotiated because Dr. Dunch hired a lawyer to represent him. Right. Got and, it. And, and, and they talk about this some on the, the Dr. Death podcast, but the, um, you know, there's such a financial incentive for hospitals in having a neurosurgeon on staff and that they represent a large amount of income for the hospital. And then if they, uh, you know, if they, have to let him go or ha or fire him then you know they're most likely going to have a some sort of lawsuit against them for this loss of income or loss of his uh his job and then that you know sort of added on top of all of the protections that you've just uh, outlined uh and that's not even really touching the other protections that um that are also there in texas where uh, um and I want you to talk about this, as I understand it. One is there's a, a, a cap on uh, pain and suffering of $250,000. And then that when you're in a case like this, that you it's not just enough to show negligence, but that you have to show malice. Is that right? Yes. So um, in Texas, we have a malice standard. So we don't have a negligent credentialing standard. You know, what would a reasonable and prudent hospital credentialing committee have done under the same or similar circumstances. Throw that out the window. We have to prove that the hospital acted with malice in their credentialing decision. And meaning, what, what we think it means is specific intent to harm a specific patient. Um, the court has not taken that issue up exactly. So what happened is that we had, well, in my prior cocaine addicted spine surgeon case, what we had was a gross negligence standard. And that was the case law in existence at the time. But subsequently, the Texas legislature amended our punitive damages statute and eliminated the typical gross negligence standard of uh, conscious indifference and inserted a malice standard. So it is believed and accepted by all that the malice standard applies to credentialing cases in Texas, which is basically the same as saying there is no cause of action because right. how can you prove specific intent to harm, especially without access to any of the evidence you need to prove it? Um, right, right. right. The, the question that has not been decided by the courts is does does malice in the context of a malicious credentialing case mean specific intent to harm, period, or specific intent to harm, you know, Mrs. Eford on June 22nd, by way of example. Um, but in terms of the caps, um, let's just take a death case, for example. If Dr. Dunch um, killed someone in one of his surgeries, and that person was not a wage earner and there weren't 
you know, medical expenses related to treatment before death or anything like that, you would be looking at a hard cap of $250,000 for Dr. Dunch, $250,000 for the hospital. Now, conversely, let's say, for example, that Dr. Dunch sued Baylor and said, you know, I'm a 43-year-old neurosurgeon with an earning capacity of modestly, you know, averaged out over the course of my career, a million dollars a year or whatever, and you killed my reputation and my earning potential because you reported me to the data bank. Nobody else wanted me because of that. I couldn't get hired on anyplace else, and I would have probably worked another 30 years. That'll be $30 million. Now, I've never worked for a hospital. I think there are some very good people who work for hospitals. I think some of their lawyers are very, very good and very good, very, very well intentioned. But I also know that there are lawyers who are advising hospitals like, wait a second, if you had to choose the lawsuit, A or B, uh, we don't want B. We don't want the neurosurgeon suing us for $30 million. And wouldn't you rather take your odds of having to have a plaintiff make a malice standard claim against you with limited damages. So I'm not in any way saying that those were the decisions that were made expressly in this case or anything like that. But um, those are the realities of the economics of credentialing decisions. When credentialing decisions are made, the threat of a lawsuit from an injured victim and the financial impact of that is a drop in the bucket compared to the potential exposure to a physician. Right. Wow. And that's really interesting because I feel like the, the Dr. Death podcast touched, touched on it a little bit in terms of describing, you know, the work that you, that you did for these patients and, and the kind of the hurdles for, for medical malpractice cases in Texas and touched on maybe the fear that the hospitals would have on being sued for, for you know, ruining Dr. Dunch's career. But it was kind of separate to, to hear you make that comparison. I mean, it makes sense in terms of if, mm-hmm. you're, if you're thinking about the bottom line and the expenses involved with the different kinds of lawsuits, you know, just like as you put it, you know, A versus B, there's a huge difference. There is, and there's also a huge culture problem, I would say, with hospitals' reluctance to report doctors. And I, uh, I made a little note of this uh, when Steve was introducing me and, and stating that I graduated from law school in 1983, because three years after I graduated from law school, when I was still in my 20s, Uh, the National Practitioner Data Bank was established by Congress. The whole reason the National Practitioner Data Bank was established was to protect patients from dangerous doctors and the recognition that there needed to be a top-secret central repository where people, institutions, I should say, such as hospitals, medical boards, malpractice insurance carriers could confidentially report information about dangerous doctors to prevent them from moving from state to state or hospital to hospital. And yet, um, as recently as 2015, uh, that's the most recent statistics I have, more than half of all hospitals in the United States had never reported a single doctor, not once, ever. And so what is happening is that hospitals are intentionally skirting the law. The National Practitioner Data Bank has specific rules for when you are supposed to report. And you could even go on there, uh, you could probably just Google it and download some free training, you know, for when to report, how to report. But we know that hospitals are they figured out how to skirt things. So for example, if the data bank says, if you suspend a doctor's privileges for more than 30 days, you must report. Okay, 
So we didn't need to report because we only suspended this doctor for 29 days, right? Mm -hmm. Or you have to report a doctor if you allowed the doctor to resign while you had an open investigation. No problem. We'll close the investigation, you know, mm -hmm. let a few days pass, let the doctor resign. Or you must report a doctor who applies and you deny privileges to them because obviously you uncovered through your excellent credentialing process, you uncovered something about that doctor that made you think he or she wasn't safe. So you got to report that too. Well, let's not do that. We don't want to cause trouble for doctors. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, you know, the administrator or somebody pick up the phone and say, you know, Dr. Smith, uh, we're going to deny your application because of such and such. But tell you what, if you'll just withdraw that application, mm -hmm. you appreciate it. So furthermore, there is no way really for us to know whether hospitals are doing what they're supposed to do and following the law. For 20 years or more, there have been efforts underway to make it be uh, one of the things that the Joint Commission surveys on. So just like they do other things, when the Joint Commission comes out to survey hospitals, they should randomly pull a certain number of files and say, wait a second, why did you not report this doctor? And there could be sanctions there leading up to pulling their certification. Um, Medicare, uh, CMS, they could make it a condition of participation. They could come out, they could randomly, uh, you know, audit hospitals and see who's doing what they're supposed to be doing and who isn't. And hospitals would take that very seriously. If their uh, Medicare license was pulled and that, that would cost them, you know, zillions of dollars, it would be a big thing. So there's not really any way to know which hospitals are the problems or which hospital systems are the problems. Furthermore, the data bank, when they subsequently find out about a bad doctor and they can look back and say, oh, well, the doctor was at this hospital and that hospital and we never got reports from them, rather than punishing that hospital, they will just allow them to file a late report. Um, even if they were to punish them, I think the fine is $25,000. I'm not <laughs> positive. Mm. So basically what we have is a system of self-regulation. And for all the trial lawyers out there, you have heard it, you've seen the story play out over and over and over again. Allow an industry to self-regulate itself, especially when it's more profitable to not self-regulate and what do we have? So it is an enormous problem. I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> right. Well, and it's not only that they have the ability to self-regulate and there's a huge incentive for them not to really regulate themselves, but they, but as you said, I mean, there is really no way to figure out what they did or, or didn't do because of the protections they have. So, I mean, that's why in this case, I mean, I, I think we should just point out to our listeners, I mean, you know, he has these number of bad outcomes at Baylor Plano. In February of 2012, he operates on his best friend, Jerry Summers, in a fairly routine uh, um, um, surgery and um, it causes him to be a quadriplegic. Uh, then he's, I think he gets suspended for a short period of time. And then the very first surgery he has after coming off of that suspension, uh, he operates on a woman named Kelly Martin and um and severs an artery and causes her to bleed to death and then after that uh he's allowed to resign he then moves on to another hospital dallas medical center uh and then has a his very first surgery that he has on a lady named floella brown um also severs an artery and causes her to die and then the very next day after he operates on floella brown he's operating on your client mary eford for the second time i believe uh, and uh, just completely botches that surgery, and uh, and Mary uh, is now in a wheelchair. Um, and then after that botch, and even after the doctors there reported how badly he had done, he then moves on to another hospital uh, named University General, and then 
continues to have bad outcomes. Um, and so it, it, it just the way this system is set up, it allowed uh, Dr. Dunge to move from hospital to hospital. And, and I guess I, I'd like to get your feelings on this too, Kay, that you know, the ultimate outcome in this case is that it had to, you had to get to the point of where it was a criminal prosecution against this doctor to get him to stop. I mean, my feeling on this is, is that if, if there were better protections for the patient set up, more openness, he probably never would have gotten this far. You would have saved a lot of lives and he probably wouldn't be in jail right now. Well, right. Um, I will say that Rob Crane and I started trying to get Dr. Dunch stopped ourselves um, early, early, early on um, before he went on to University General. And then there was another outpatient surgery center as well. And one of the best ways I knew how was to take to the airwaves. And I happen to know um, a very good investigative journalist here in Dallas. Um, and I called him up and I said, you know, here's the problem that we have. And we'd like to get the story out so that any patient could be warned if he does get privileges any place else, which I highly doubt he will, but to warn patients to stay away from this guy and to warn hospitals, you know, and so, you know, in the background of all of this was the subsequent hospitals had to have been living under a rock because it was blasted all over the media and um, in a lot of popular magazines and it, there was a big thing in the Dallas Morning News. So, and <clears throat> Rob Crane actually called uh, the administrator of two of the hospitals and said, look, if you don't know this, let me tell you what we know. And with University General, um, he was told to his face, you know, like, well, you know, we know you plaintiff's lawyers and, you know, he's got a right. clean, you know, he's clean with the medical board and he's clean on the data bank. So thanks, you know, thanks, Mr. Crane, but you're kind of one of these untrustworthy uh, plaintiff's lawyers. Uh, it, it was just outrageous, but, I will say this, we, even though it appeared that Baylor did not report him to the data bank and gave him the letter of recommendation, we assumed that Dallas Medical Center was the end of the road. We assumed that Dallas Medical Center would take the position that they were duped by Baylor, but boy, it didn't take but you know, three surgeries for them to figure out that he was, uh, you know, very, very dangerous. Well, we really thought that would be the end of it because surely Dallas Medical Center would report him to the data bank. So between the report to the data bank and everything that was out in the press, no hospital or surgery center in their right mind would touch this guy with a 10-foot pole. But subsequently... We, of course, we can't prove it because whether they reported to the data bank or not, also completely privileged, we'll never know that. But mm. he obviously went to other hospitals. So the subsequent hospitals either completely ignored the negative report to the data bank to their own peril, or they relied on the data bank to the exclusion of all of the other scuttlebutt uh, so that was an enormous problem. But I, I will add one more thing, and I'm sorry, just go on. You've got me wound up now. But <laughs> <laughs> um, we tried to, and I did, um, subpoena and take depositions of some of the people that were in the OR during some of these really bizarre surgeries. So by way of example, in the Eford case, we know that in most of these spinal hardware cases, you've got the medical device rep there who's repping the product, who's giving pointers to the doctor. Um, we know that there was um, a C-arm fluoroscopic x-ray images in the OR and that those were projecting up on the screen in the OR and that, you know, according to Dr. Henderson, you know, 
anybody with a modicum of training all the way down to the x-ray tech could look at that and say, wow, that spinal hardware is not even in the spine. And yet no one was willing to come forward with me and say, I'm on the side of the patient and I don't have an ax to grind here. I'm just going to tell the truth. But more than that, there was dodging and weaving and, well, I don't know. And, you know, I didn't really see anything. And, you know, I subsequently found out in some of those instances that that just, that wasn't true. And it couldn't have been true. It absolutely could not have been true that everyone in that OR did not know that he was out of his mind and that he placed spinal hardware, not in the spine, but in the musculature and allowed him to close her up and send her to the recovery room. And I guess they went home and had dinner with their families and had a good night's sleep. And, you know, I've practiced law for 30, I don't even know, 30 some odd years or whatever. (laughs) And I just still, it just makes me want to grind my teeth to dust. Like how can people live with themselves? And so we do have a big, big culture problem in that regard. Yvonne, what does every successful law firm need? Really great lawyers like me. That is exactly right. Really (laughs) great lawyers like Yvonne. Uh, They also need cases, right? Right. And uh, what's the way we get cases? I think I know where you're going with this and I'm going to say our website. (laughs) Our website is a big one and the best website firm out there is Digital Law Marketing. Yvonne, tell our listeners what Digital Law Marketing does. Well, they can help you with things like search engine optimization, pay-per-click marketing, social media marketing, content marketing strategies, web design and development, Reputation management, which sounds very mysterious. I I definitely need some reputation management. (laughs) I'd like to find out exactly what that does. We need to look into that one a bit more. Uh, And they also do local search. And I'm sure if you call Mike and Stephanie over at Digital All Marketing, they will tell you what local search means. And they'll tell you what all of these things do and how it can help build your law firm and get you cases. Call Mike and Stephanie or look them up at their website, digitallawmarketing.com. Again, that's digitallawmarketing.com. So my understanding, I think, from the podcast was that not you can't just, not anybody can search the, the National Practitioner's Data Bank. You have to be an eligible, I guess, hospital or healthcare provider to, to search it and see anything that would have to be reported in the first place. And so related to this, this culture, what do you think is, because it would seem logically sort of like that as a hospital, you wouldn't want to get one of, of the, these physicians, and hopefully there aren't a lot, but that you wouldn't want to, to be uninformed if, if one of those physicians wanted to get a job with you. So it would seem like they would all be wanting to, to report <laughs> instead of the opposite. Right. It, it makes sense. And Um, you know, there are a lot of doctors who are very, very interested in patient safety and also very concerned about the problem. And doctors are concerned themselves about their own care and their family's care. But the difference is, you know, they have the ability to ask the OR nurse, what do you know about this Mm. doctor or whatever? Um, But, you know, one thing that my clients had in common is that there's been enough education of the public that people mostly know now, before you choose a surgeon, go online, look them up, look into their background, whatever. And most of my clients did that. And he had, you know, a five-star rating with this organization. He was chosen, he was featured in a video on the best docs network, et cetera. And you all know we have that in the law as well. I mean, 10 times a day, we all get those solicitations. Do you want to be the, for only $250, you can be selected as the number one litigator in America. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Right. People don't realize that doctors have the same thing. So as consumers, these patients are going on the internet and saying, wow, I saw this video of him with these cool looking 
you know, microscope goggles on in the operating room with this, you know, sexy music playing in the background. And he was featured on the best docs network or whatever. It, it, that may not even be the name of it. But while all that marketing engine was working on the front side, on the patient facing side, there was all of this horrible stuff that was known to the insiders, so to speak. Um, and that persists today. You would have no way of knowing. Right. Yeah. I, I, I was just said uh, there, there's another great article. If anybody's interested in this case on a, um, a propublica.org about this and it is uh, the best docs network the where there was a video of him. And then also in health grades, he was getting four and five star reviews. And, and it is talked about on the, on the Dr. Death podcast about how when you go to search Dr. Dunch, if you're a patient, you're, you're trying to do your due diligence and figure out who the best doctor is. Um, there's really no way to figure out that this doctor has had a number of bad outcomes. Uh, and in fact, if, to look him up online, sounds like he's a great doctor. And then, you know, the... I guess I'd love to hear you talk about the the whole uh, doctor referral network because you know I think everybody assumes that when a doctor refers you to another doctor, it's because they know them and they think they're a really good doctor, but that's not really the case either. Well, doctors themselves will, good doctors will complain to you about this and they will recognize this themselves as a patient safety issue because it's complex because it can have to do with health insurance plans or perhaps hospital systems where, you know, as I call it in the olden days, um, you know, back in the Marcus Welby good days, the doctor referred to a doctor that they knew, liked, and trusted. And patients assume now that if your doctor that you know, like, and trust is referring you to another doctor, it's because they know, like, and trust them they would send one of their own family members to them, but that's not the case. They may, and in many instances, they are blind referring uh, to doctors because their health plan requires it or the hospital has said, uh, we really want you referring to one another or perhaps the hospital's in-house paid marketing person has brought you a plate of cookies and come around to visit with you about the hospital's hotshot new young neurosurgeon. And we'd sure appreciate it if you'd help us get his practice up and going. And it's just the money makes the world go round, you know, that in addition to that, the hospital, there's economics involved with the hospital. If they've guaranteed the doctor $600,000 advance a year, the only way they're going to get paid back is for them to help him get his practice going. Um, so it's a big problem. Yeah, I'll I tell you. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kay. I know. I'm just going to tell you as an antidote. Uh, <clears throat> you know how it is when you're <coughs> a lawyer. You're the the source for everything, and so. One of my in-laws had a friend who was undergoing back surgery and his HMO plan only had three back surgeons on there. And I said, well, send me the list of the back surgeons and I'll make you my recommendation about who I would choose. So I go through the list and I was like, I don't know any of these doctors, but I personally would choose this doctor. She's a female. She trained at Harvard. She did a residency at Johns Hopkins. That's who I would choose. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask a spine surgeon that I'm acquainted with. So I call the spine surgeon that I know, and I run through the list of three with him. And I say, you know, hey, I, I think this Harvard Johns Hopkins trained person, whatever. And he's like, no, you know, um, her hands, she doesn't have good hands. And I was like, now, how would anybody ever know that? Right. Um, so I just personally, I, in my lifetime, I don't think it will ever happen, but why in the world would there not be complete transparency for us, the patient to know disciplinary actions, bad outcomes? I mean, hospitals track all of this data. I'd like to know how does my doctor compare to the other doctors in the hospital for 
post-operative infections. Well, yeah. Why did that get to be a secret? But I'll tell you something else that I've noticed is picking up a little traction these days is all of us lawyers will know that we're subject to negative online reviews. I've been a victim of it myself. Any Tom, Dick, or Harry can call you off the street and they don't like that you wouldn't take their case or whatever. They can just trash you on an, an online review. Well, doctors are being able to, are, are also getting these negative online reviews. But now they are whining. There was an editorial written by a doctor in the Dallas Morning News. And then I saw something on the internet recently where the doctors are trying to come forward and say, this is really interfering with our practices and this needs to be shut down. And I'm like, well, let's hope that doesn't happen because a grassroots, you know, legitimate review process might be the only thing that'll help the patient. Yeah. Um, well, I also wanted you to talk a little bit, Kay, about, um, I mean, we, we've talked, I think, a lot about it, but I just want to make sure that the listeners have heard it, about how this case really uh, finally came to light and how there was, you know, action taken on it. You talked already about the fact that you were able to get your uh, friend, um, who's a reporter for the Dallas Morning News, to cover it. And I think even on the podcast, they talked about the day that you sent uh, him a you know, sort of a, you know, hey, you should look into this. Somebody else had also sent him, you should look into Dr. Dunch. And so for him, it was like, you know, just weird. These two unrelated sources both say look into this doctor. But I think also it's important to point out that in this case, I mean, uh, it sounds like several doctors really started speaking up, but especially two that were uh, talked about quite a bit was Dr. Robert Henderson, who was an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, and actually did the the uh, repair surgery on on um, Mary Eford, and then Dr. Randall Kirby, who was a vascular surgeon, who had done uh, some repair surgery uh, on um, uh, some of the other patients. But talk about how it really got to I guess this tipping point where you know finally uh, it was you were able to get Dr. Dunch to stop from. Uh, surgery, including the fact that it finally it resulted in a criminal prosecution? Well, it's the, the first and only time in my career that I've had members of the medical community coming to me as a lawyer saying, please help us. We don't know what to do, and we have a moral obligation to stop this guy. And we've tried, and we can't. So for example, you know, Dr. Henderson and Dr. Kirby had both contacted the medical board. The medical board said, you know, we're aware, but we have our processes. We've got to allow, you know, for due process with Dr. Dunch or whatever. And, and literally, I, I had never heard things like this before. Literally, they're, you know, Dr. Kirby is like yelling at the medical board saying, you don't understand. He is going to kill other people, you have to stop him now. To heck with his due process, do an emergency suspension. And, you know, these are very credible physicians. Um, the medical board's position was, <clears throat> you know, thank you, but we really rely on hospitals. We take hospital reporting much more seriously than we take doctor reporting and we take doctor reporting more seriously than patient reporting but the hospitals apparently hadn't reported to the medical board so um, we began trying to get the story out into the public as much as possible and we really did think that DMC Dallas Medical Center was the end of the road well in the process of working up the Eford case and the two cases that happened at Baylor, as well as Floella Brown's case that happened at DMC, um, Dr. Kirby is sent a fax one day to his office saying, please join us uh, for an exclusive dinner. There was this, there's this old school restaurant in Dallas called the Old Warsaw, you know, where you can go down there and get get things that have gone out of vogue now, like lobster thermidor and, you know, it's right. just, yeah, 
chocolate mousse. And it's just this really old school, really nice restaurant near downtown Dallas. So this flyer says, come down and meet our new director of our brand new neurosurgery department, Dr. Christopher Dutch. And, you know, Dr. Kirby calls up the administrator of this University General Hospital, which, by the way, is not affiliated with any university. It's <laughs> in a very, you know, low socioeconomic part of town. It was a hospital that had turned over many, many times and was kind of known as a bad hospital. And a group of investors from Houston came in and threw some money into this place. But Dr. Kirby calls that administrator or owner who himself is a physician and says, what in the, you know, are you doing? Do you not know who this guy is? And, you know, according to Dr. Kirby, this doctor himself said, well, you know, Randy, you know, this is just a bunch of plaintiff's lawyers. uh, And he's clean with the data bank and he's clean with the medical board. So that's good enough for us. So, Dr. Kirby contacted me and said, can you believe this guy is still operating? Um, And I don't remember exactly what happened after that, whether we went back to the press or whatever, but then another whole round of victims started coming forward. Mm. Um, At some point, Dr. Kirby and Dr. Henderson said, gee, are doctors ever criminally prosecuted? And I told them, I said, you know, I've been down this road before with like pill mill doctors because I've done a lot of pill mill type cases over the years. And the truth of the matter is most district attorneys are not interested in prosecuting doctors. It's outside of their normal wheelhouse. They're complicated. They're expensive. And they are just not interested. But make a call. Let's see if we can get somebody interested. So we initially had a meeting with someone in the DA's office, an assistant DA, who listened with interest, and we waited and waited and waited, nothing ever happened. Then in follow-up, it got reassigned somehow, and I'm not sure if Michelle Sugar heard about the case and raised her hand for it or whatever, but uh, she picked up the case, and to her credit, she learned the medicine she learned the facts of the case, and she was just tenacious. Uh, so I, I think it is still rare in this day and age that state level, you know, county level type prosecutors will prosecute doctors, but they did, and the jury apparently agreed that this was beyond egregious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, we'll be talking with Michelle next week to hear how, why she decided to take a case like this. And, you know, especially for someone who had been doing, you know, mostly criminal uh, work her whole life and, and then to take on what is a you know very complex medical case uh, had to be difficult. And um, and uh, but but uh, she certainly did a fantastic job with it. Well, the system never went on trial. And I, I did ask Michelle that that question. I said, did you ever consider. uh you know, trying to prosecute any of the hospitals or any of the individuals who were responsible for making this happen as well. And she said she had thought about it, but that that would have been more the purview of a federal prosecutor or something of that nature. But yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you know, you would think with a case that got this much notoriety 